Okay, now we're going. Uh, students, uh, sorry for getting here late. I was stuck over in the faculty center. Um, and also, sorry, for a few of you uh, I traveled all the way up to campus on Tuesday to, uh, to find that class had been canceled. I ought to have put a blurb somewhere in web courses, a couple places, uh, telling you that you don't have to drive up to campus for my class. Tuesday, sorry about that. I should have done it earlier, and I'll, if, hopefully I won't have another absence, but if I do, I'll, I'll, um, I'll make an announcement about that a little bit sooner. We got a lot of stuff to talk about today. We're going to be talking about energy. Uh, again, we're going to work with energy and angular momentum. This is an interesting quote from a, um, a mathematical physicist out in California, John Baez. There's a picture of him. Well, the stress energy tensor is a basic gadget throughout physics. And since we all want to know where energy and momentum are going and how much there is sitting around, right? Guy is an excellent teacher. I, re I try to read as much of his stuff as I can. He's a very interesting guy. But before we get more into uh, his quote, I have a few announcements uh, first to help you with your studies in general. Uh, first of all, a talking PDF. I mounted a talking PDF into the blurbs page yesterday. And a talking PDF is my phrase for a PDF that's encoded with um, animated sketching and audio. In other words, me narrating. And if you've already downloaded it, it works really nicely. Here's what it looks like uh, when you uh, open it up in Acrobat Reader. And I don't know if, if you know, there's other things that, to look at PDF files with, but uh, Acrobat Reader is what I recommend for these. Now, uh, what we're going to do, let me park this over here. Uh, I'm going to show you how to view and listen to it here. Um, so let's take a look at how it works. Um, we're going to switch to the uh, desktop display here. Go ahead. All right, now this is, um, this is in Darian's email. I emailed this talking PDF to her this morning. Okay, what you want to do is click on the blue, where's the cursor? Okay, what you want to do is click on the blue uh, livescribe.com uh, slash player link up here. And what that does is it opens up a, a web page, livescribe.com, etc., etc. And then what you do is, where did you save it? So it's on the desktop? Yeah. Okay. What you do is you go to your desktop or wherever you save the PDF file. Uh, let's check, see if you can see if it's in here. Dude, We're bur it's burning our grits here. Can you find, oh, maybe it's in download. What? Let's quit it. Let's quit out of there. Get that start. Where is it? Where's the PDF? Well, it doesn't download anything. Right, okay, hold on a second. Uh, let's see if we can download it to the... Let's go back here. This is Windows... <laughs> This all, even I have to use this Office 365 stuff now. It's all right. See if you can. All right, let's download to the desktop. Let's right click. Uh, save as. I'm really starting to get ticked off. How come this doesn't work? How come it doesn't? Because all your other PDFs that I've sent to you. Maybe it's because it has to save it to the actual computer. Because usually you just pull it up through email. Really? Yeah. 
it usually doesn't download all the way. <sighs> all right. Don't go on it. I wanted to show you guys. I want you guys to see it, it talking, but it, uh, anyways, um, let's go ahead and just open it back up again. All right, so when you're in here, and unfortunately, we, oh, wait a minute, maybe this will allow it. Download. Yay. All right, now we can... Now, where is it? Show in folder. Dude! This is like the blue screen of death. I hate when... I'm starting to develop hatred feelings. Anyways, an annoyance. Uh, anyways, you click on this thing, and it takes you to livescribe.com, and then you... So you, you get your computer to download it to your desktop or your download folder. And then you click this and you go and find it. Now, we're not allowed to download that onto this computer because it's Windows and it's owned by the university. And uh, Bill Gates doesn't allow it because he's smarter than everybody else. And so, But anyways, you do that. And then you just click on it, and it runs really good. Now, you know what? I'm going to show you how to do it. Switch over to the laptop off. I just showed you the livescribe.com slash player web application. Now, this one will work easily. Oh, wait a minute. That's all right. That's good. We're good. Um, you also have a, a desktop app. You have an application you could put on your laptop. It's called Echo Desktop. Here's what the download page looks like, okay? And they have a Windows version, and they have a Mac version. And um, when you uh, start up the Mac version, it looks a little bit like this. And you, and this, these are all the different uh, talking PDFs I have on my computer. Uh, I basically. The way it works is I have a special notebook with special graph paper and I have a little pen uh, in this box here. Uh, this is called a smart pen and it's a regular pen with special ink and a camera mounted in the nose of the pen. So it sees everything that I write. Now it doesn't see very fancy it doesn't see pictures and, and you know, uh, a mountain or a lake or anything like that, but it sees what I write. So I, and then it records it and formats it into a PDF with narration. So what you do is you click on whichever one you want, and then it opens it up and it looks like this. And then you click on any area that you want, and it'll bring up, a player here, right here, uh, and that'll, you know, that'll do the same thing. You can adjust the sound and everything, and you can see my whole calculation. And unlike this, this lecture this morning, the software, this software runs good too. The web application, livescribe.com slash player, works good. This desktop application, desktop echo or echo desktop, it also works good. So I highly recommend to you the uh, talking PDFs. And this one is a, is a blurb on the three calculations that we have had uh, on exam one. So if you want, if you felt like, boy, I really got caught napping on exam one, or if you just want to review, even though you got it right, uh, go ahead and look at that talking PDF. By the way, it'll print out just like a regular PDF. So you mean you can have a printout of it too. All right. Now, questions. I hesitate to ask, but if you if you have any questions, go ahead. Okay, let's keep going. Here's the rest of John. <laughs> let's get back to something that I can handle: tra uh, energy and stuff. Here's the rest of his quote. Well, the stress energy tensor is a basic gadget throughout physics 
since we all want to know where energy and momentum are going and how much there is sitting around, right? But it's only in general relativity, in other words, black holes and the Big Bang Theory and all that stuff, only in general relativity where the stress energy tensor is sitting proudly on the right side of an equation, telling space-time how to curve. And that's the essence of Einstein's theory of gravitation. The general theory of relativity says that uh, gravity, instead of a, like a force that accelerates things, it produces a curvature in space-time itself. And this equation here, go ahead and write this down. You're not going to have to do anything other than look at it. But you may as well write it down. It's not that hard. This is called the Einstein field equation. Or uh, it's sometimes called the Einstein field equations, plural, because each of those two subscripts um, symbolizes or encodes uh, four to each of the four dimensions. So there's 16 of them. Uh, in here. The Einstein tensor is G subscript AB and the stress energy tensor that John Baez was talking about is capital T subscript AB. Now um, the stress energy tensor this is where you encode all your forces and energy and all the nitty-gritty of nature as my, uh, one of my uh, professors in grad school said, this is where all the smokestacks of nature are. You know, your nuclear forces, heat, um, mass, electromagnetic interaction, all that stuff is encoded over here. So like GM1, M2 over R squared would it be encoded um, over here in the stress energy tensor. And then over here... On the left, the Einstein tensor, this is where all the, the elegant mathematics is. And it encodes the curvature and the geometry of space-time itself. And so I always like to use a picture of a beautiful garden. And, and actually, both of these photos are photos from the island of Japan. One is from a beautiful famous garden, and one is from the smokestacks uh, down by Osaka, you know, a bunch of factories running, all right? But that's the way nature is. Now, I want to show you another way to look at it, and that is, how would Sir Isaac Newton look at um, the Einstein field equations? Well, he'd say, yeah, okay, I, I, can, I can see that. Because my law, F equals MA, or as I have it written down here, MA equals F. It's kind of backwards, but still the same equation. Um, yeah, I've got smokestacks and forces over here on the right. That's where GM1, M2 over R squared comes in. And then the MA, this is where Einstein and Newton differ. Einstein said, don't think about accelerations. Think about curvature. So Sir Isaac Newton was thinking about M.A. And Einstein's insight, his profound insight, was that you replace all those accelerations, that whole concept, with curvature of space-time itself. And our solar system uh, is no great shakes in the theory of relativity. It does have a little bit of curvature. Uh, uh, but not, not a whole lot, because the sun is not that big of a... Uh, the sun's never going to become a black hole or anything like it. So, uh, But other systems, yeah, there's significant curvature. Anyways, so Sir Isaac Newton's formula, yeah, that's not too bad. You know, you got smokestacks on one side, and you got your, uh, your trajectories and stuff. The geometry is all laid out in MA. So, yeah, it's, it's consistent. It's, um, and, you know, I... Einstein's theory of relativity never replaced it. It just made it even more precise. It's a different way to look at it, and it works really good. Now, I want to do, that's just kind of a historical uh, footnote uh, for you about energy and Einstein and John Baez. I want to do some clicking with you, and what we're going to do now, we're going to do some work, a workout with work, uh, and I want to think about a hammer on the moon. 
And one thing about, so get your clicker out. We're going to be doing some, some multiple choice and some calculating. So get your calculator out too. Matter of fact, you're going to need your calculator in just about two seconds. A G is smaller on the moon. So let's see uh, and, and take a look at the actual value. Yeah, uh, G subscript M, uh, the surface acceleration on the moon, negative uh, 1.62 meters per second squared compared to our uh, 9.8. So it's, it's smaller. And the reason for that is that the mass of the moon is about 0 0.0123 of Earth's mass, and its radius is about 0 0.2725 of Earth's radius. So, uh, you know, so things are not quite as strong as on. If the Earth were smaller, it might have this, you know, you could, if you could crush down the moon's mass into a smaller radius, then gravity would be a little more intense. But what we've got, it's... 1.62. Now, let's take a look at this hammer from uh, Home Depot. And I looked it up. The mass is about 0 0.703 kilograms. All right. Now, the first thing that we got to do, it, as with all these things, try to figure out a, a work, an amount of work done. Let's figure out the force. What's the weight force of this hammer on the moon? Go ahead and calculate. It's a multiple choice question. Thanks, Barry. I wonder. When we're in between questions, can you see if you can transfer that? PDF to the chip. No, never mind. Never mind. That's too complicated. It's not going to work either. All right, how are we doing here? Okay. Okay, 25 seconds. And here, you guys, this is something we've studied before exam one. And you, we're going to find that as we go through the semester, we're never going to stop talking about the weight force, F equals MA. It's all going to build together. So, all right, 10 seconds, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero. Okay. Uh, and the answer is negative 1.14 newtons. Most of you got that. Very good. Okay. Hit the refresh key because you're going to do a, a calculation now. Numeric answer. Um, and But before we get to that, let's recall the basic strategy of energy and free fall. And that is it, once you set the baseline elevation you know, y equals zero, you can calculate the gravitational potential energy at any height. So y equals whatever you want within reason. So then if you know the kinetic energy at any, any point in the trajectory, so the top of the motion, the bottom of the motion, right before impact or any, anything in between, you can figure out the total mechanical energy, capital E, all right? And once you got that, um, you can figure out the complete dynamical state of the object at any level. In other words, you can figure out the GPE value in joules. You can figure out the kinetic energy value in joules. You can even figure out the speed value, you know, whatever it happens to be. Right? And for that reason, we're now going to try a calculation with the same hammer, right? And we're going to try it for an astronaut uh, in the lunar module, standing on the lunar module. The astronaut drops a hammer from the, the hammer, this hammer, from the small platform of the lunar module from a height of 2.2 meters above the surface of the moon. 
Okay. What is its kinetic energy halfway down at height 1.1 meter? Okay. Now you need mg, the weight force on the moon, etc., etc. Go ahead and work on that. Derek, can you turn the lights to full? And I'll give you a couple minutes to work on this. Every time I look over there, you start giggling or so, or you jump. Gosh. You know, I missed you guys on Tuesday. I was kind of, I was feeling poorly. I was cranky all day. And I guess it's because I didn't see your lovely smiling faces. Well, almost everybody in here smiles most of the time. You know, I was watching this. I better not say it. I'll tell you. I was watching. He just got this he smiles like he tries to smile at the end of the first movie and it's, it doesn't really smile his face just goes it doesn't it doesn't turn up at the end it just kind of, kind of levels up I don't know but, uh, but it's pretty exciting okay now I'm back on all right take your time Give me two significant figures, okay, 0.01 joules of kinetic energy. Let's see what these answers are. Let me do it all right, I guess. Can you make this thing bigger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it doesn't show any more. Mm -mm. Gosh. Windows software. It's typical. <coughs> Negative. Make sure you're careful of your... Is kinetic energy ever a negative number? No, it's never negative. So if you have a negative sign for your answer, better amend it. I see some negative numbers in here. It's true though, I always it always cheers me up yeah. to see you know to be in class. Whenever I'm feeling you know, like if I just get out of a faculty meeting or something and I'm feeling cranky or if I'm feeling low or something like that and I come to class I usually it cheers me up. Except for seven AM final exams, that it doesn't have that effect. But it's <laughs> 7 a.m. final exams. Who had a 7 a.m. final last semester? Oh. They're heinous. 7 a.m. finals. 
Because some instructors actually start at seven. That's the word, and I'm one of them. I, if I have one, I started at seven. That's why I hate them. All right, one minute. By the way, students, this is the halfway point of the semester. This is lecture 14 of 28. Our last lecture will be lecture 28 sometime in April. April something something. And then finals week. Twenty seconds. It's it's useless because it keeps updating. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Let's see what the see if there's any no. Okay, so your answer is uh, one point two five. Uh, not many of you got that, so let's just look at the other answers here. Okay, look at this twelve point five three. You biffed up some uh, decimal point. Uh, Twenty six point one. What is that? I have no idea what that is. Uh, here's somebody with negative 1.25. No. Kinetic energy is always. Here's 0 0.12. That might be another decimal point error. Let's just see what we got here. One. Okay, now you guys in here, 1.21, 1.24, 1 1.26. Round off error. All right, now these guys, 10.26, that looks like a typo, maybe. All right, can you go back to the regular display? Okay, so here's your answer. Now, here's the, go ahead and jot this down. Uh, the speed at 1.1 meter is uh, 1.89 meters per second. And you can verify that later uh, if you want as a study exercise. Um, and uh, let's keep going. I, I want to review a few questions about centripetal acceleration. And these ones are going to, again, go back a couple weeks to when we talked about centripetal acceleration. The reason that we're going to do this is because we want to... Uh, approach uh, the idea of angular momentum. So let's go back to thinking about centripetal acceleration. Here's your next question. Oh, uh, hit the refresh key again, because we're going back to multiple, multiple choice. OK, here we go. Test driver X takes this track at a steady 88 miles an hour. Read it very carefully and think. I see people paging back in their notes. Very good. That means you're thinking. And thinking is where I want you to be. Uh, there, theoretically, I can do that web application from Safari. Because H, if I switch my sound, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do them before class, okay. before I start the podcast. 
and then the, the or the, the rest of the lecture will be we'll just pass you know we'll mention it as we pass okay that'll work okay 15 seconds to vote Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ching. Okay, let's see what the. Oh, go ahead and show that. Okay, we've got a spread of answers here, so that tells me that we got a little bit of explaining to do. Go ahead and back to this. Here's your explanation. The, the answer is turn two. 40% uh, of you, the, the plurality, that's the biggest group, uh, did vote correctly for that. But the majority of class voted elsewhere. So how do you decide it's turn two? Well, if you're, the, if you're going at a steady speed, the only difference is the radius of curvature of the track. All right, is it a fast turn? Or a slow turn? Is it a, is it a tight turn or a, a broad turn? Now up here, a uh, turn two uh, is a small radius, a small turning radius. So you could you could sketch in a little circle there if you like. It just barely grazes and touches uh, as you go through the turn. Now the the entire turn is not a perfect circle. You know, like at Daytona they are. They're circular, uh, not, not even half circles, but they're part of a circle. But this one's not. But down here, whatever else these turns are, turn one is a bigger radius. All right. Now, in this, so I noticed a bunch of you paging backward into your notes, the formula for uh, centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. So if R is different, the R with the smaller, the turn with the smaller R value is going to have the smaller denominator. Okay, V squared is 88 miles per hour quantity squared for both accelerations, V squared and V squared. But the R's are different. And so the smaller R is the tighter turn and the larger centripetal acceleration. Another way to think about it informally is this. Uh, where are you more liable to skid out? You know, where, where are you more liable to um, lose the grip on your tires? You know, if you have bald tires. And I was driving around here a few years ago with a, oh, man, that tire was really bald. I was really nervous driving around on that thing, especially in the rain. If you have bad tires, you're going you're gonna to lose them in turn two, but you might be okay in turn one because it doesn't require as much centripetal acceleration to take that at 88 miles an hour. Now, second question. Next question. Um, Scaredy Cat Joe decides to run the straight, same track at low speed. Now, so he's going all the way through it at 4 meters per second. That's about 9 miles an hour. So let's just think about turn one for this question. Okay, uh, 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, good. A bunch of you, uh, most of you got that one correct. It's less than. Now, here, if you wanted, if you didn't get that one right, and a bunch of you did, did get it right. Here's why. Joe's V is smaller, 
So V squared over R1 is smaller for Joe than it is for driver X. <coughs> okay, so there's your... Now, all this is designed to get us thinking about things on curve trajectories, the velocity state, the radius of curvature of the, of the track, uh, because we're, now we're going to uh, apply these concepts uh, to look at orbits. Now, this is an infrared picture. This is a false color infrared picture of the Andromeda galaxy. And the Andromeda galaxy is the nearest spiral galaxy to us. It's visible in the nighttime sky on a clear night in the summer. It's not up right now. You can't really see it very well. But in the summer, yeah, you can see it if it's really clear and you have good eyes. Um, now, let's talk about orbits. Now, recall Newton's three laws and universal gravitation. Uh, we reduce them to a slightly simpler, simpler um, relation uh, between orbital speed, the center of the central mass, in other words, the planet, you know, whatever planet, or, the, the, you know, the sun, if it's a planet orbiting the sun, um, and the orbital size r. And we said that gm over r is equal to v squared. Now that was by using a little bit of um, simplification and cancellation and so forth. And v we talked about as well, that on circular orbits anyways, uh, the orbital speed is just 2 pi r divided by the orbital period, capital T. All right? Now for... Um, for elliptical orbits, it's a little trickier because the orbital speed changes. You know, that it's really slow when you're far away from the central mass and it's really f at perigee and it's really fast when you're at apogee. Anyways, here are the examples that we talked about. For instance, putting a, a, a spacecraft in low Earth orbit, uh, low enough to view the Russians, you specify the R that you need, and then from that you compute the speed. So the if you want your satellite to be um, 180 miles above the Earth as it passes over Russia, um, then that means your uh, radius from the center of the Earth out to your satellite is about 6,700 kilometers. And so the rocket, you figure out the V from that, and, and V has to be about 7,700 meters per second, or... 17,000 miles per hour. And that's roughly the, the speed that the space shuttle and the Mercury um, astronauts, the Apollo astronauts, when they were orbiting Earth anyways, that's about the level and about the speed that they're going. All right? And you can compute it a little bit more um, accurately, but that's roughly the, the right speed. Now, um, as I mentioned before, um, if you have a geosynchronous satellite, you specify the orbital period, 24 days, and then you compute R from that. Okay, so the, if, if the orbital period is 24 days, 86,400 seconds, then that allows you to figure out, you know, using V equals 2 pi R over T, um, that the speed is 6,900 miles per hour. And so the rocket has to boost the satellite all the way up to 42,200 kilometers, an altitude of about 35,900. And that's about 6.62 Earth radii away from the center of Earth. So those, those um, communication satellites for, net, uh, for DISH network, direct TV, and so forth, uh, telephone communication, uh, TV broadcast and stuff, radio, even radio uh, programs come over the, the satellite now. Uh, those are about 6.62 Earth rate. They're, they're out there. They're way out there. Uh, so those are big satellites, and you got to get them on the right altitude, and they have to have the right speed, or they won't stay on a circular orbit. And if that happens, you're in, you know, you're, you put a big, expensive satellite up that won't work. So you got to be really careful. And they've put up satellites that you know, miss the orbit, you know, they blow up on the way up to that orbit and so forth. Here's a picture. Uh, something like a spy satellite viewing the, Ru the Russians is going to be in low Earth orbit, L-E-O, 
uh, and uh, at least over when it's passing over Russia now, when it's passing over Australia, they don't care how high it is there. So perigee is um, uh, right here, and apogee is out here. So it's really slow out here because gravity is really slow. And down here at perigee, where it's close, to, it's really whipping because it's a lot closer to the center of the Earth. Okay, so that's what you call an orbit of high eccentricity. Now, the geosynchronous satellites, they want to stay on an orbit of zero eccentricity, a perfectly circular orbit, or as close as they can make it. And they can make them really close to perfect circular orbits. Okay, and that's way out there. So that's what the, those things look at, uh, what they look like if you were to, to map them out. Now, orbital parameters, radiuses and masses, we already talked about. And the way that you describe the orbital state is the orbital energy, capital E, and the orbital angular momentum. Okay, and angular momentum is the momentum that an object has with reference to some central point that it's either passing by or that it's actually in orbit around, whether it's an elliptical orbit or a circular orbit or any other kind of orbit. All right, so let's talk about what is angular momentum. And this is stuff from chapter five. It's a special kind of a momentum that you see when you look at ice skaters. You know, and you look at an ice skater and the ice skater spins up and then, and, you, know, they, they, you know, they have their arms out and this skater's got her, her leg out and her arms out. Her center of mass, you can kind of tell where her center of mass is. It's right, usually for humans, it's right about the belly button. So right about here, and that's right over her skate. So right about here is her center of mass. And she's extending out, she's extended her leg. She's trying to slow down. But you know, if you're looking at ice skaters at the Olympics and whatnot, when they bring their arms in, they really speed up, or they can really speed up if they do it um, properly, okay? Another way to think about it is a bicycle wheel spinning on its axle. Now, each centimeter of the tire is like a pixel of mass, you know, so many grams of, of mass, um, and it's got a, a certain amount of speed. So it's got some P equals MV momentum. All right. Every single, um, no matter how you pixelate the tire, centimeter by centimeter or millimeter by millimeter, each pixel of the tire has got some mass and some speed. All right. And um, the thing about all of those together, however, is that they're all oriented to the axle. They're, they're never getting closer or further away from the axle of the bike, bicycle wheel, all right? So even if the, point, if the wheel's not moving from point A to point B, so you got your, your bicycle in your garage, it's upside down, resting on the handlebars and the bicycle seat, and the wheels are spinning, they're not really going from point A to point B, but they still have angular momentum. There's still a lot of MV in all those uh, pieces of mass. Each gram of mass has got a bunch of P equals MV, and that's angular momentum. Angular momentum is a conserved quantity. Just as if there are no external forces acting, the momentum of the boxcars is conserved, the momentum um, of the skateboarders is conserved, you know, momentum is equal to zero for the skateboarders. And same thing with angular momentum. And on uh, Tuesday next week, I'll tell you exactly why that's the case. It's something called the Noether theorem. Now, here's a strobe picture of a crescent wrench that's sliding across a table. All right? And it's an overhead picture uh, of, a, of a crescent wrench. And I want you to look at it carefully. Look at it right now. Every right here, see where I have my cursor? There's like a little plus darkened in. 
let me see these these uh, bluish diamonds. Let me move them down into place. All right, those bluish diamonds are now covering up that darkened in. Um, plus that darkened in plus. Here it is again. That's the center of mass. Now in chapter five, I've got a discussion of center of mass for irregular objects and for symmetric objects like blocks or spheres or stuff like that. Okay, this is an irregular object. But yeah, right here. And you can see that the center of mass is motating at a certain speed, a constant speed. It's not really slowing down very much. Not yet anyways. All right. But you can also see that the angular state is changing. You know, over here on the left, the jaws of the crescent wrench are kind of pointing up and a little bit to the left. And over here uh, on the right side, the jaws are pointing down and to the right. So this thing is changing. It's spinning as it goes. It's, that's perfectly fine. Now here's another picture. Um, look at this guy. No, as soon as he gets off the ramp, you know, he starts spinning, and it's, he's up there in the air. He doesn't really have much air resistance. So he's just going to keep spinning all the way through. And, and if he does it right, he lands upright over here on the left. Now here's another picture. I, I, I cannot fathom doing this. I, I honestly cannot. I mean, I've done some crazy things in my life, but good golly. Uh, anyways, you can see this guy, he's spinning. And his center of mass, he's like a baseball. The center of, make a note of it for this, for this motorcycle guy. He's like a base, the center of mass of him is like a baseball, all right? So you, all the, the laws, F equals MA and all that stuff that we already learned applies lovely to the center of mass. You know, his center of mass of this motorcycle rider uh, is just following the same path a baseball might. But he's still spinning, and he's spinning about the center of mass, you know, and that's what gives everybody the thrill because, he, I mean, even if he wasn't spinning, it would still be pretty nervy. But he, he, he designed his jump so that he spins exact. Let's see, how many times does he, does he spin? Let's see. One. Yeah, his head is, look at this. Look at this. At the very top of the arc, his head is up on the top again. And over here, it's, he's, he's leaning back. And so over here, look over here. He's leaning forward by the same degree. All right, so that's good. He's, he's done it. He's designed this jump pretty well, and he's executing it pretty well. All right, so that's conservation of angular momentum when he's in the air. If he's not in the air, then he's got other forces and stuff. But once he's in the air, yep, he's going to just keep spinning until he hits the other side of the ramp, the, the ramp on the other side. Another kind of system uh, that keeps spinning, exoplanets. And yesterday, NASA had a big announcement about some exoplanets. The TRAPPIST-1 system, about 40 light years away, I think they said. This is the artist's conception of the seven planets, B, C, D, E, A, E, F, and G, and H. And this is from um, an article in Nature uh, by Alexandra Witz. And I'll post the, uh, the link for this in additional reading a little bit later today. So you don't have to worry about copying this down. Um, here's the picture again. And let me just emphasize, we didn't take snapshots. So we don't know if planet G is green or if planet B is orange or anything like that. We do know the color of the star, though. The star, it's, it's a dwarf star. It's pretty small. They're pretty close. But they think that at three of these are right at the right distance where they don't get so hot that water won't pool into lakes, rivers, and oceans, if there is water. Now, they're going to be looking really, really hard for the sign of water, the spectral image 
uh, or the spectral uh, lines of water. And I'll be talking about spectrums uh, a little bit later this semester. So yeah, we don't know that. Yeah, you know, look at this one. This one, a planet F, it makes it look like it's got continents and an ocean stuff. We don't know jack about it. Here's, here's what we know. This is from another article. This is the data that they analyzed. Uh, and this is from the technical uh, letter, also in Nature, published yesterday. Uh, actually, I think today's the 23rd, so this was published today. Seven temperate terrestrial planets around the nearby ultra-cool dwarf star TRAPPIST-1. And there's the author and so forth. And I'll post this one uh, also in additional reading so you can pop it out and look at the data. Let's take a look at this. Here's, this is probably the most important image. And here's the, here's the brightness readings up here, these top two images. You know, they look at this thing, you know, for a certain number of days or months or, or even years sometimes. And then they look for dips. Now, you can see here that there are dips. When they stretch out the time scale, all the dips look like this. Okay, so basically, th these things here, right here, it's bright, then it dips down and it's dim, then it dips back upward and it's bright again. You know what that is? That's an eclipse. What we're looking at there, this is what they know. They can see the background star, TRAPPIST-1, and by looking at the brightness, they see the brightness dim just a little bit every few months or every few days. And then here's it, and they found seven separate dips, you know, so seven different planets. In other words, the dips happen over seven different periods of time. Okay, um, so from that, they figure out this picture of the orbits. And hey, you guys, look at that picture. Orbits, circular orbits. And those planets, they're all in the same plane, just like the solar system. You know, we don't have planets orbiting at random orientations, you know, like flies buzzing around a, uh, uh, you know, a, um, a, a dead uh, you know, a dead fish out by the river or anything like that. You know, we have our, our plants are all very orderly. They're all in the same plane. Same thing here. Now, I want to um, point out to you some uh, angular momentum videos uh, in YouTube. And we've been uh, posting our lectures to YouTube every day. And uh, you can go in there. And in addition to the, um, what do you call that? The, uh, it's not a list, the playlist. The playlist for our course, there's other playlists. Uh, and some of them are called demonstrations. But here's one, a separate set of YouTube videos for angular momentum. And if you look carefully at that, you'll see our two lovely TAs in this one. There you are, Darian, and Miss Caroline. Uh, and you'll see a bunch of my TAs over the years in these videos. Okay. Now, let's get back to brass tacks. What is it that can change the angular momentum state? Well, the thing that we know changes momentum is a force, a net force. Right? If we have a net force, it'll change P. It'll change the momentum. Right? What changes the angular momentum? Well, that's something called a torque. And for a real object that's extended, you know, like, a, like on page 74, this diagram of a, a plank floating in a, in a lake, in a pond, um, where are you... Uh, how much force, how much F equals MA, and where you apply it. So if you apply force F2 over here at point A, or force F1 over here at point C, you'll get a different angular momentum state for this board. If you um, push with force F1, 
and you, you push straight through the center of mass C for this board, all that board is going to do is just going to move off. You know, you're going to give it some momentum uh, upward, and it's going to move off in that direction. But if you push at point A, you'll be giving it some upward momentum, and you'll cause it to spin because you're pushing um, about the center of mass of the object. Okay, and that's called torque. Now, I invite you to read more about that in chapter 5. All right. Also in chapter 5 is this concept of uh, the moment of inertia. Now, inertia itself is a, a quantity that we measure in kilograms. We use a scale, basically, to figure out the amount of kilograms or grams that an object has. The moment of inertia is slightly different, and it encodes the difficulty or the easiness of spinning something up or spinning something down, changing its angular momentum state. Now, the symbol we usually use for momentum, especially orbital angular momentum, is capital L. The Symbol capital I is the moment of inertia. Now, the moment of inertia is the sum of the quantity mr squared for all elements of mass, all pixels. So if you think of an object, you know, a bicycle wheel or dumbbells like this, um, pixelated, you know, into little cubic centimeters of steel for the dumbbells or cubic centimeters of rubber for the bicycle tire and so forth. And you, uh, you multiply the mass of that pixel times the distance from the axle or times the distance from, you know, like right here, if it's hanging from a string attached to the center. If you measure that distance R and square it and multiply it by M, and then do that for all the different elements of mass, all the pixels, all the way around the bicycle tire, every pixel of steel in, these, in this pair of dumbbells, and, and then add up all the MR squares. That's the um, total moment of inertia. Now, in Chapter 5, uh, you'll see a table of the moment of inertia for a set of objects you know, a few regular shaped objects. But in theory, um, adding up all the MR squareds for even an irregular shaped object, you know, like a space capsule, you know, you know that they just put the Dragon capsule up there. They sent it up to the space station. They launched it here a few days ago, and it's, it's now up there delivering supplies. Do you think they know the moment of inertia of that? Uh-huh. And why is that? Because a lot of these spacecraft, they want them to spin as they move. They give it a little bit of angular momentum. It's called, and that's so that it doesn't get baked on one side by the, you know, the sun out in space is pretty intense. So they may give it a slow roll. And to do that, they have to know the moment of inertia. And you can read more about that in chapter 5 and invite you to do that. The other thing that we're going to do on Tuesday is start chapter 6 on heat. So um, let's dismiss now. And actually, we started late and we're finishing early, so that's not too bad. Homework 10, uh, we'll cover uh, a bunch of this stuff. So you want to do the reading. And I'll try to have that ready by tomorrow morning, and it'll be due on Tuesday. You are dismissed. 1141, a little early today. <laughs>